Okay, um, thanks for being on time. And then I will get started. So I will introduce myself um, and, and because I'm going to introduce the all the speakers for today. Um, so I'm Da Yulin and uh, um, I started my PhD at uh, Duke University and uh, with uh, late Larry Katz and I study uh, olfaction at that time uh, in the coding the main olfactory bulb and then um, I went to Caltech as a postdoc fellow with uh, Dr. Dave Anderson. That's where I start to find my uh, passion for aggression. <laughs> so, um, so sort of uh, moving from you know the olfactory, uh, the periphery end, and uh, slowly uh, find my way in um, into into the core part of the brain, which is essential for generating the social behaviors. Um, I started uh, as a system professor at NYU from uh, 2010, um, and uh, I've been there since then. Okay, so today I'm going to share you a little bit uh, recent updates on the neural mechanism of aggression. So I have to say that I changed my slides kind of a little bit uh, last night because inspired by um, the talks yesterday. So some of them might might feel a little bit not all smoothed out because I haven't talked them like a hundred times, but um, hopefully we'll, um, we'll find that echoes better on uh, giving a little bit algorithm feeling um, for, uh, for the audience, okay? So yeah, so first of all is why study aggression? I know probably not so necessary um, for this audience because uh, there are a lot of aggression aficionada here. Um, so, but I do want to say that aggression is one of the robust uh, innate behaviors. So by innate, I mean aggression is not required learning. Um, although uh, through our studies, we do find that the circuit can be refined uh, a lot. So, but if we take the definition, we kind of agreed on yesterday, that is the initiation of the behavior uh, doesn't need to be taught. I think the aggression can fit into um, that realm pretty nicely. So the animal does not to be explicitly learning aggression. They kind of uh, figure it out by themselves over time. Um, they do aggression levels is typically below at the beginning of the encounter, social encounters. Um, but then over repeated experience, then it ramped up um, over time. So it's a, it's a behavior that exists both in the, from the insects uh, to the fish. Um, fighting fish here, um, and all the way to the mice and the humans, mammals, uh, um, avian species. So we see it very widely. Um, it, it serves important survival functions. So when there is a resource to be compete, um, when there is a mate uh, to be compete for, when there is a territory to defend, um, or just to protect yourself, there is a, a need to uh, to go for that kind of forceful actions in order to resolve those things. So the aggression studies are dated back for nearly a hundred years now. So during the initial studies, it was uh, kind of this rough, uh, called a knife cut experiment. So basically it was done in the cats and then uh, the cats was anesthetized and the cut was made um, throughout the brain here. You can see just a dissociated anterior from the posterior part of the brain. And then what happened next is when the cat wakes up, if the cut is made posterior <coughs> um, to the hypothalamus, um, then you, the animal seem to be docile and fine. But when the cut is made anterior to the hypothalamus, then um, there is this sham rage behavior is being observed. So basically when the animal make, wakes up, um, they will start to show this uh, spontaneous rage responses whenever um, they being very minimally provoked. So those experiments are uh, suggesting two things. First of all, is that the aggression, um, the hypothalamus appears to be a very critical site um, that can get the aggression um, to be expressed. And the second of all, the uh, areas that anterior to the hypothalamus is probably exerting some sort of a tonic control over the hypothalamus to suppress aggression, which is understandable uh, considering that aggression is a very costly behavior um, to um, both the aggressor and the receiver, so it should not be expressed lightly. And then uh, moving forward, um, 
uh, actually around the same time, there is a, um, a series of uh, studies uh, again in the cats uh, using electrical stimulation, uh, trying to figure out uh, which part of the brain can evoke certain behaviors. So um, uh, they mapped throughout the hypothalamus and then found that in the lateral hypothalamus, um, when the cat was being stimulated, it caused this uh, predatory behaviors, this uh, um, cold biting behaviors. When it was in the median hypothalamus, then uh, elicit this uh, defensive rage behaviors. So uh, again, this pointing to the hypothalamus as being a potential uh, critical site for aggression. So uh, later, uh, studies in the rats, which is through the hundreds of electrodes, so there was a, this kind of aggression studies that comes in waves, and the waves are spaced out uh, by somewhere around uh, 30, 40 years. So um, this is sort of the second wave, and then down in the rats, and then with the hundreds of electrodes that uh, systematically uh, stimulating um, the hypothalamus, and then uh, mapped out to this uh, region called the hypothalamic attack area, which is showing the red here. So um, it was a find that when this area is being stimulated, then the rat uh, can uh, uh, initiate this uh, cold attack uh, from uh, uh, towards a frozen rat or a female rat. So. Um, and uh, uh, the, throughout all the studies you can see from the cats all the way to the rats, uh, the technique is virtually the same. Uh, it's the electrical stimulation that was being uh, refined. Uh, the electrode is getting smaller, so it can fit uh, in a smaller brain. Um, but conceptually, it's very similar. So um, when I, uh, when I uh, started to kind of uh, entering this field about uh, now over um, almost um, 12 years ago now, so, um, and the key thing uh, which is summarized it was, uh, was this area called the ventral lateral part of the ventral median hypothalamus. So it's actually part of this hypothalamic attack area, which you can see uh, showing the overlapping area between the green, uh, between the blue and the red here. And that's part of the reason uh, why we start to focus in on this area, and also through immediate early gene mappings and the loss and gain of functions, a series of studies. Um, so uh, this area, uh, we, we pinpointed, uh, that's sort of our main contribution, is really just to refine these big areas and then bring it to the mice, which allows it to use uh, uh, genetic animals. Uh, a lot more genetic uh, tools. Uh, so it's interestingly, I actually started this ex experiment using the exact same tool, which is uh, the electrical stimulation. So I try to electrically stimulate those cells and uh, trying to reproduce the data that we have observed in the cats and the rats. After running 50 mice, I, I kind of give up because I couldn't reproduce those results. Um, every time I stimulate it, when the current pass, I see the animal runs away from the other animal instead of approaching it. So that's a hopeless experiment. So um, it's only towards the very end when optogenetics become available, uh, then I revisit this gain of function experiment and was able to uh, uh, got it to work. So uh, in retrospect, the reason is being that actually the VMH is uh, the hypothalamus in general. Um, they are uh, subnuclear as a group of cells that's uh, very closely uh, situated but playing very distinct roles. So very close to the VMH VO is the region um, called the VMH DM, which is the dorsal medium part of the VMH. And that part of the brain is essential uh, for the predatory defense behaviors. And because of that, and the axons actually running through from the DM um, towards the VL and then go to other regions, the electrical uh, stimulation does not allow distinguish between the uh, axon terminal stimulations versus axon stimulations versus cell body stimulations. In fact, uh, electrical current is more efficient to recruit the axons um, than, uh, than the cell bodies. As a result of that, um, and uh, maybe if I try another 50, I will have my lucky animal, but uh, in general, it, it, it's a very difficult thing to do when the brain is, uh, is small in particular and the current just doesn't have the sufficient controls of it. Um, so anyway, enough of that. Um, so some of you might have seen this video, but this is a kind of, uh, uh, I would say the highlight 
of showing the VMH VO being an essential part um, for eliciting aggression. So um, when the VMH VO is being optogenetically activated, uh, we see that the mice will start to attack um, the male mice, the female mice, uh, anesthetized mice, and in the extreme case, um, this inanimate object, which is a bro up a glove. So the idea of the glove is to mimicking a human hand, although, um, I mean, it's, I think it's a good idea not to put my hands there. So, um, <coughs> so yeah, so they really show this sort of uh, supernatural behaviors um, and uh, which will be targeting a suboptimal target. That's not very uh, naturalistic in a way. So, um, so this behavior was not observed in the mice. It has been reporting the cats in the, in, the, in the rats and now in the mice. So one thing obviously is what's going on inside the brain of those animals and what makes them um, to attack. So uh, Andrews made a point yesterday, I was like, I don't know what the animal is doing when I have to genetically activate those brains, and, you know, something happened. Um, um, this is sort of, I would say, we're probably slightly um, a more confident to what the animal is doing uh, when there is a very naturalistic a sequence of a behaviors and uh, quite a mimicking uh, the, uh, the aggressive actions. Um, but still, um, there are many interpretations of why the animal is doing what they are doing. So, uh, are one thing... Are you putting something that normally the mouse is afraid of? Such as? Such as uh, something with cat smell, like an object with cat smell, or something that normally it will, doesn't dare to attack. Yeah, so, um, no we didn't. Um, I think the... Um, the underlining question of this is whether if there's a something normally with suppress aggression um, can counteracting um, this activation effect, right? So uh, we didn't try that particular experiment, but we didn't notice that when the animal is, uh, let's say, uh, engaged in sexual behaviors, especially during intermission, which is the more advanced stage, um, then the stimulation often fails. So, and it turned out that the uh, intermission, during intermission, the VMH VL activity is naturally suppressed. So there is a force that can counteracting it to change the threshold of the stimulation. Yeah, and I will imagine fear is probably one of the factors as well. Yeah. So, okay, so why the animal attacks? So uh, there is actually, this is not something we come up with, but has been a debate ongoing in the field for at least 50 years. So basically, the animal attacks because this, uh, this stimulation can evoke uh, a series of actions. So it's a fixed action pattern generator, uh, so to speak. And then uh, the alternative is that it increases aggressive motivation. So uh, motivation is, uh, again, a very abstractive term, so maybe not as much as a feeling uh, for the animals, but um, it, it indeed is some sort of internal state that are hard to grasp onto. So in order to understand the motivation uh, a bit more like concrete, so we decided to use uh, some sort of a behaviors which is measurable, so which is aggression-seeking behaviors. So what does aggression-seeking behavior <coughs> mean? So we need to talk about the kind of a two forms of aggression. One is called a reactive aggression, and the other is a proactive. So reactive aggression is when um, something, something um, to say insulting happened, um, but best example is like a road rage, and then you reacted to it. Um, so proactive aggression, on the other hand, it requires uh, some uh, planning stage, uh, such as those uh, chimpanzees, they will march out to the neighboring territories and then uh, initiate fights as uh, single out individuals. So um, in a human example, I like this one, so um, reactive aggression, if uh, you have been in a bar, but we're all very polite people here. So, but somebody if it happened to say something insulting and you punch that person on the face, so that would be called a reactive aggression. 
But if you are sitting in your dorm and thinking how much you hate that person afterwards, and then, okay, we don't need to drive a car here, um, but let's imagine drive a car and then go to that person's house and then punch that person on the face. So that's called a proactive aggression. Okay, so the key difference between here is this seeking phase. And then uh, we want to ask whether the VMH reveals actually kind of play a role in this seeking phase of aggression. So um, we'll say that mice are naturally aggressive. That is uh, pretty much um, in the resident intruder assays. Mice is one of the species. Actually, we don't really need to overtrain them in any ways in order to get aggressive behavior. So that's one advantage of using mice for this kind of studies. For the males, you simply have single house males and put another stranger male in. And uh, likely, you will get a fight between these two individuals. So, but does the mice who will seek the opportunity to attack? So, Anna Faulkner, very talented poster in the lab, come up with uh, this aggression self-initiated seeking paradigm. So, basically, in this paradigm, uh, what we do is we will introduce uh, a, a, a panel with uh, two pokers. So, the animal is freely exploring, and they are very curious animals, so they will poke left, poke right, and they will. And then, when they poke one of a dedicated port, we call it a social port, and the animal will be rewarded with an intruder. So, one key factor here is this intruder is uh, a weak intruder, so it's a smaller in size, it's a group housed intruder, and uh, it's a, from a string that's relatively less aggressive. And, but the animal doesn't have to attack, so they can do whatever they want with that intruder for about 10 seconds, and then the intruder will be removed. So if they want the intruder to come in again, then they need to poke the social port again. If they pour the other port, which is called a no port, and then virtually nothing is going to happen. So here is a little video clip showing that how it works on the ground. So this is an animal that has already uh, well trained for this uh, task. So one thing you may notice is the very short latency for this animal to attack, actually. So if you study aggression, typically it takes like a minute or two for the animal to kind of ramp up the, um, um, their uh, called arousal state and then to initiate, to get ready to initiate attacks. But here, they really start attacking pretty much right away. So they're already very prepared for this intruder to come in. In fact, they sometimes will climb up and look up kind of uh, in the search of uh, where is going to be the falling intruder. Um, so remarkably, which to me is a bit of a surprise that the animal will actually learn that. Yes? I'm sorry, is, is it always a different intruder that the mice gets after each poke? I mean, I also have a feeling it's a smaller mouse. It's a smaller mouse. It's not always the same intruder. Uh, usually we have um, we have a group of five. It's a group housed animals, so we just randomly pick one um, from that cage. So, yeah. It could also happen that you have a big No, the, the whole, whole cage of uh, five mice, so they are all like weaker and uh, smaller than this uh, test animal. Uh, so the test animal, the aggressor, is a Swiss Webster strain, usually, although it works with the 57 mice as well. So they are slightly bigger in size, and uh, they are either single housed or housed with a female. So have the litter, so, so they, they are pretty aggressive. Okay. So in those uh, Bob C's, uh, um, we did not do a particular hierarchy test. We did not see fightings among themselves. Um, so um, they, occasionally there could be a mouse that actually appear to be potentially a bit bigger than the others, but in general they look fairly similar. And uh, the aggressor kind of attacked them indistinguishably. Yes. Um, so the experimental animal is housed in the museum? 
The experimental animal is either a single house or they are housed with uh, a female. Um, but prior to the experiment, the female and uh, the litter, if there is any, will be removed. Could it be that it's just making uh, social contact and that's why it's actually referring to have an animal? Yeah, so that's totally a legit, and I think the social motivation, social is a very strong motivation in fact, um, uh, social as itself as a reward, so we cannot really uh, excluding the social as a part of it, um, and uh, we have done a couple of experiments I will explain in a second to, uh, to convince us that it's not just the social uh, that is motivating those behaviors. Yes. Is it some special mouse line? Because it doesn't look like six, right? So, yes, so, okay. Um, it's, it's correlated with the, okay, so here is that their animal learn and animal doesn't learn. For the learners, they are poking, I'll get to your question in a second. So, uh, the, for the animal that uh, learn that, which we'll call the seekers uh, or learners, that they will poking rate goes up, and that's about half of the animal, and depending on how persistent you are in training them. Um, and uh, for the animals that doesn't really perform this task, so their poking weight will went down um, over the days of the trainings. So one thing we did notice is that, so we're trying to understand a little bit what is the difference between those animals that seek and animals didn't seek, right? So um, they actually fairly similar in their body weight. When we get them, um, they're all single housed, the retired breeders with Webster's. So, they are all fairly big, about 35 grams per piece. So, and then they're not dumb. So for some of the animals that refuse to seek in this task, cooperate in this task, we have put them through a more, um, to say, conventional operant conditioning task associated with the water, um, and they can learn that fairly well. So, but one thing we do find, which is quite correlated with how well they will perform this task, is their aggressive levels, aggression levels. So the animals with the higher aggression levels, they will uh, learn it a lot faster. They, some animals get it in two days. So we don't think that they're dumb, they just, uh, um, you know, for the learners, so we call them learners, but they probably learned, they might have learned, but they just decided that's not something they're interested uh, in playing the games. So to that point, um, is that you don't really need a special mice, I think in every strain, so they are mice, can do that, but they are genetically uh, predetermined in a way, um, differences in how aggressive this overall strain is. There is always a distribution um, within a strain, but for example, Swiss Webster, when we get them from, um, uh, uh, from uh, I think we got them from a taconic, um, 90% of the animal, 80% of the animals are aggressive um, upon their arrival, but uh, for 57s, they are, um, let's say, 50% perhaps. And then it also varies depending on whether we got them from Jackson or Charles River. <laughs> they have a slightly different substrings, and then the ones from Charles River are a little bit more aggressive <laughs> than the ones from Jackson. So there's a lot of subtle differences here, and I think there's like uh, uh, genetic differences in the aggression levels uh, to begin with. And then, um, but yeah, but as I said, for C57s, uh, for the aggressive ones, uh, they can learn this task uh, pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, the muscle you put out on, uh, after learning. Uh, do you group house them, or you do, for example, the surgery? I didn't see if there was optic fibers or um, um, electro drives. But what's the procedure before they are engaged to the experiment? Yeah. So for most of the experiments in this one, we actually uh, so the procedure is they are single housed, and for the Swiss Webster, actually, uh, since they are proven breeder, so they arrive and the single housed, and then. And for some, we give them females, so we don't want to deprive them with the social interactions altogether. So, um, and, uh, and we actually train them first to make sure that they learn and then perform our additional experiments. But in one set, we actually uh, didn't train, but um, did the surgery first and then do the training. So it depends on the purpose, whether we want to sort of see the progression um, of, of the uh, changes in the neural activities throughout the training. Yeah. Do you see any difference between the co housing and the single housing? Like co housing with the feet in terms of aggressive, aggression levels? Because for us, for example, like co housing with the female doesn't work so well. Yeah. And the isolation makes the rats quite aggressive. So 
Yeah, so they both make them that animal aggressive, the isolation and then uh, the co-housing with the female. So these are the two typical procedures we use uh, to enhance aggression in the lab. Is there some difference between the, those two protocols, so co-housing and co-housing? Um, I think they are an additive effect. So we often typically have the animals start by just uh, uh, isolating them. Um, and then test the aggression levels. So if they are not aggressive, then giving them sexual experience can further uh, enhance it. So, yeah. Okay. But if they are aggressive, then uh, giving another female, well, to say I, I, we did not systematically test it before and after. Okay. So, okay. So one thing we want to uh, understand is um, is whether. Um, uh, is this uh, aggression, is this uh, seeking behaviors is really for social interaction purely, or oh, it is actually um, related to the, to the aggression itself, and in particular the weaning. So we found that, so we did this task, which is um, we uh, using submissive intruders and then train the animal to learn the task, and then we replace this submissive intruder so with a non-submissive intruders um, for three consecutive days. So the non-submissive intruders are uh, similar size the Swiss Webster animals. So they are as the intruders uh, within this 10 seconds, they typically will not initiate any attack towards the resident. But if they are being attacked, they will fight back um, pretty well. So, and then later we will change it back to the uh, submissive intruders and uh, see how this poking goes. So the idea is that if th they are mainly seeking for social interactions, then um, this uh, non-submissive intruders uh, will serve as a social target for their intact as well, and the poking rate should not change. So what we observe is that the actually the non-submissive guys, uh, the, as an intruder, substantially suppress um, the poking rate of those uh, experimental animals. So it does appear that the outcome um, of the fighting, which is a guaranteed winning in this case, is uh, very important for sustaining the behaviors. And we also tried other type of experiments, which is like we prevented the fighting from happening, so we put them under a cup, and then the animal is allowing to intact through, uh, through the gaps of the cups, but couldn't really uh, attack the animals. You will see sometimes they try. Um, but in those cases, we see the poking rate go down to approximately half. So we think that those type of experiments are suggesting that it's not just um, the, um, the, the social interaction alone, but also the fighting itself, the consumatory action of the fighting um, that being critical for sustaining the behaviors. So this, um, uh, this paradigm, we tried it in about nine animals, and they are fairly consistent um, across those nine animals, um, perhaps except the one here, uh, which is turned out to be an absolute alpha male, and he realized that he can't attack anybody and win anybody. That put into his cage, so he just uh, resumed um, his uh, poking fairly rapidly. Okay, so, so okay, so now, um, after uh, the, the animal get trained, uh, we, obvi uh, we obviously want to ask whether the VMHVO uh, is uh, playing a role in this uh, seeking phase of aggression. So uh, what we did is uh, to train the animal first, as I said, and uh, then uh, using the dread eye strategy to uh, reversibly inhibit the VMHVO um, by interleave the CN on the saline injections. And then at the end, uh, we will uh, using a water reward as, uh, as an, an alternative uh, uh, to examine whether the seeking is very specific, the deficits is very specific um, to the aggression or to any kind of uh, goal-seeking behaviors. So this is an animal that uh, is learned and then went through this procedure. So we can see that on the CNO day, the poking weight is uh, decreased, although um, in general, it still prefer the social port. And interestingly, actually, when they did a poke, um, they appear to still attack uh, fairly reasonably. So th they still initiated the attacks. Um, but in a resident intruder assay, we can actually see uh, the attacking rate goes down. So that kind of says that when they actually poke their aggression um, in this ready state for the aggression already. So uh, overall, the poking rate um, is consistently dropped 
on, on the CNO day in comparison to the sailing days uh, across the animals. And then uh, we do not see a change in the water uh, seeking behaviors. So that suggesting that uh, this seeking behaviors is specific to the aggression, but not a general behavior. So, so we, we heard yesterday that many regions actually appear that if you look harder, they appear to be involved in many other places. Um, so, so, so far for the VMH VO, we have in, we indeed finding that there are other aspects of the social behaviors that the VMH VO is engaged in, um, but we haven't found clear evidence that this area is engaged in non-social related behaviors. So, um, so then the next thing obviously is uh, to asking whether we can enhance the seeking behaviors um, by optogenetically activating these areas. So in this case, we did not uh, stimulate uh, when they are actually intacting because we know they are going to fight. Instead, uh, we activate the cells as the animal is um, uh, single in the cage and uh, then kind of just uh, wandering around a uh, poke left or uh, poke right. Um, so we want to see that whether that's going to make them poke faster. So we interleave the light trials with the non-light trials showing here. So the animal is already well trained and then um, we um, in, in interleave the trials. So we give a little bit boost of the VMH reveal activities and asking whether that's going to um, shorten the poke latency. And that's indeed the case, showing the blue dots here. You can see that the uh, latency is consistently low in those cases. And if uh, this is uh, consistent across trials, across different days, and across many different animals. So, um, so confirming that the VMH VO can also um, shifting the aggression seeking behaviors the left way or right ways. Obviously, it's very crucial to really understanding the actual neuronal activities in this, uh, uh, in the spring regions. Yes? Um, have you tried, have you tested which objects will be attacked when you stimulate the VMH and which objects, objects will not be attacked? Let's say if you stimulate the VMH in the empty box, mm -hmm. what will mouse do? Or if you put, not the glove, but a like smaller or different size object, mm -hmm. or maybe a <coughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, is there some difference which yeah. objects, like, I'm just curious how do they select the object for, for attack, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah, so first of all, without anything that's um, uh, uh, in the cage, and then they are, they might slightly increase their locomotion, but not uh, obviously. Um, so, they just walk around. You, you couldn't really tell if I'm telling, I don't tell you when the stimulation happens. Um, so, if we, uh, in terms of our object, I, I tried a, a couple of different ones, and I think um, the texture of the object is very crucial. It has to be something that they can bite on. So, I've tried a metal object. They don't really try to bite it. Um, so, what else? Oh, and the other thing is if the object can move, like if for the glove, if I kind of artificially moving it, um, then they're much more likely to attack it. So it appears that there are still different elements that um, it's not a completely basically activating a modal circuit, pre-programmed modal circuit. They are still a little bit context dependent um, in that sense. Yeah. So for the learn learners, we have tried a little bit uh, with the DRADQ approach, um, and um, and I would say anecdotally, there are some worked, some didn't. And I think that really reflecting whether they actually understanding the contingency or not. If they don't understand the contingency, then it's hopeless. But if they do, and we increase the aggressive motivation, yeah, then we can turn a non learner to a learner. So, okay. Yes? I was wondering if in the interior test, with the speaking maker, is that set specific? Do they also see for a non Oh, the, uh, it, you mean after they learn it, if we put in a non-receptive yeah. female, what would they do? Yeah, 
uh, yeah, so we accidentally put in females occasionally. Uh, <laughs> so I'll say they will initially bite, but they will quickly realize that's a female, and then they will stop attacking it. So the female is naturally having a suppressive effect on the aggression um, behaviors. And so even stimulating the DMH does not override that? Oh, 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 yes, yes, it will. It would, okay. It will, totally yeah. will, yeah, yeah. So if you pick one of the submissive guys and then you try to stimulate the BMH, yeah. you think you can turn them into being a bit aggressive? Or yeah, so we didn't do that experiment particularly, um, but Nira Xiao has a um, uh, set of experiments using the dread cues, and then they basically activated the VMH reveal in a variety of the animal conditions, including castrated animals, um, as the intruders, as the group housed animals, uh, and they found uh, in all these conditions, um, the VMI trivial activations uh, can enhance aggression. Um, to which extent um, they enhance, um, somewhat depending on where they come from, where, what's the starting point. Yeah. So in the, in the aggressive animal, do you use uh, optogenetics to activate the aggression? Right? So when you, when you pop in this music guy, then you play the light? Oh, no, no, no. So in this <coughs> experiment, the stimulation only occur when uh, the resident, when the test animal is in its cage by itself. But it's optical. Yes. Yes, because my concern is that maybe the jet activation is sort of, it's not pulse, it's not a start signal that the kind of firing and the activation in use of the jet is much more intense and highly locked compared to the that you start increasing the excitability of it, but not really driving Sure, yes, of course. Uh, there, there are different mechanisms in kind of drag, how drag Q and uh, channel option works, right? So in this case, we want to have a more precise temporal control of uh, when the stimulation happens. So we do not affect the attack itself. Um, because attacking actually can bring in the aggressive state, it has these positive feedback groups. So we want to really only manipulate the activities um, during the period they're waiting. So that's why we choose the optogenetic method in this case um, instead of the drag queue. But I assume, it, I suppose, if you, yeah, and then we tried it. If we do the drag queue and if they are low pokers, we can make them become yeah. higher pokers. So, yeah. How normal is this VMH and the job is activated for hyper CPU? Because at least two sensories you say are involved because what it's about, it doesn't go for mental or first goes and then touches and then it doesn't continue because it gets feedback from something like tactile or sensory stuff. But on the other hand, you say if you move the object, it goes more, and it also gets into this little VMH area from visual So the VMH VO. Yeah, so the VMH VO itself. Um, mainly receive olfactory inputs. So I will show the electrophysics data in a minute. Um, so we have now find a concrete evidence that. The VMH VO itself is influenced much by the visual itself. Like when we do it in the dark, it appears to be just the same. So, um, but I think there is a potentially downstream regions that is uh, receiving inputs from VMH VO and also other visual areas, and how easily or how ready those regions uh, um, become activated to finally initiate attack. Um, I think that depending on partly on the visual stimulus and the movement is probably part of it. But so at least in the should be less. Yeah. Because they cannot see the movement. Um, well, they usually, so the mice that they are operating, they're pretty nocturnal animals. So they, uh, the visual cue is not something required. Uh, and they, they can also kind of assessing the uh, locations of the animals based on some auditory cues or factory cues, or there are many other cues. Yeah, <coughs> that can be used. Okay. Actually, uh, I'm rather critical about the, uh, the aggression seeking task. Okay. Because uh, uh, my, my point is that uh, uh, is it 
uh, do the mice uh, have uh, uh, the social drive? Because uh, they have very simple environment and they are in uh, isolation. But is it really uh, a social drive? Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, I know an experiment where birds were isolated, and in this case, they really uh, they learn really fast to just to uh, press a lever, and uh, which causes uh, an image in, in this uh, in this box. So, if we um, let the mice uh, do anything else, not to um, uh, I don't know, uh, not a social content, but anything like uh, an image or... Oh, an image. Uh, I doubt an image will work in this case. So... Or smell or anything. Yeah. Um, so certainly there can be uh, other things which might be... Uh, yeah, I, I, I get your point is that, okay, the mice is in the cage, it's isolated, it's pretty boring, so just make something happen could be exciting, right? So I think that's where, you know, the variety of controls, which including uh, introducing animals that's not attackable, or putting aggressors, or putting like a bigger animals, all these things. As I said, I don't think, so there are many things which sustain this behavior, so potentially, when there's just a simple excitement, something happened, and then there is a social, and then there is aggression. I think that they kind of added it to each other. And then later I will show you um, some uh, additional paradigms that we, uh, which we will have, instead of having one side being nothing happen, but something will also happen on the other side. So, and then in those cases, they still go for the side that was the social target which I suppose is uh, per perhaps a better control than just a known control. Is that sufficiently answer your question? Okay. So um, you say that uh, aggressive behavior is rewarding, right? Um, if we are talking about that, so which part of the behavior is rewarding? If Will the mice no spoke just for stimulation of VMH while they don't have an intruder and object to attack? So will this motivation, of course, be rewarding for them or only when they can execute attack, it is rewarding. Yeah, so that experiment, um, uh, actually the self-stimulation experiment has been um, tried at least once in the rats and uh, we tried a little bit um, and uh, the result is mixed. So we do not see a consistent uh, strong preference for uh, the side um, that the animal